Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Alberta Wilderness Association's uh, first talk of 2022. Uh, my name is Philip Meinzer, and I work as a conservation specialist with AWA. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the presentation this evening. Uh, if you could please mute your microphones to avoid any background noise during the presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we also have someone on tech just sort of stand by to mute if, uh, if for some reason there's an issue. Um, so that everybody's aware, we are recording this presentation um, and it will be posted at a later date, um, likely on our website someplace. Uh, if you do have any questions, there will be time at the end of the presentation to ask. Um, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you as a resident of Calgary, Alberta, or Mokinstis in the language of the Blackfoot people. Calgary is part of Treaty 7 territory, the home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tsutina, Stony Nakoda, Six Sika, as well as Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, I'm a born and raised Calgarian, uh, and I feel responsible to my obligations under Treaty 7. And as a descendant of European settlers, uh, I feel that I have a personal responsibility to atone for the mistakes and intentional harm of our ancestors. Um, through my work with AWA, I feel like I've provided an opportunity to contribute in a hopefully meaningful way towards reconciliation as we seek to protect Alberta's wilderness for current and future generations. Um, we do this in partnership and collaboration with Indigenous peoples from across the province. Um, I hope you all take a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands wherever you may be joining us today. Now I'm going to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Kel Weider. Uh, he is a professor of biology at Villanova University in Pennsylvania. I'm familiar with Dr. Weider's work through AWA's participation in the Wet Wetlands Technical Advisory Committee, uh, which is part of the, the broader oil sands monitoring program. The, the floor is all yours, Kel. Thank you, Philip. And welcome everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank the Alberta Wilderness Association for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna try and keep this heavy on pictures and light on actual data. So I hope it'll be an enjoyable presentation for everyone. In the first slide here, you see our land acknowledgement and we're not Canadian. My group is uh, from the United States, but we certainly understand and appreciate that as researchers from a different country, we come to the lands of Alberta to study peat bogs. And these lands have been the traditional lands of several First Nations groups. And so we understand that the view of air and water and land by First Nations groups may be different from traditional Western views. And we respect those views of our, our friends in First Nations communities and are honored to be able to work on these lands. So with that as a brief introduction, here's a brief outline for today. So I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time on what I'll call Peatlands 101, just to make sure everyone's on the same page with regard to some of the terms and, and peatland uh, functions and structures that I'll be talking about today. And then I'm gonna talk about two different things, wildfire, you know, all Albertans know that wildfire is a big thing in, in Alberta. And the peatland carbon sink. So that'll be section two. And then I'll transition probably fairly abruptly to talking about the effects of oil sands development in the Fort McMurray region on the peatlands of that region. And so I'd like to start with acknowledgements. And so the work that I'm gonna talk about has been the work of a large, large number of people. So traditionally we had a group of undergraduate students, graduate students, technicians, and research collaborators spending either all summer or a lot of the summer living in Alberta, doing field work uh, and lab work uh, in various places across Northern Alberta. So these are some pictures from over the years. Oops, sorry. Uh, and I particularly wanna, point out this slide here. So that's me in my younger days, better looking days. This is Dr. Dale Vitt. So Dale Vitt is a peatland ecologist, spent years at the University of Alberta and was the director of the Devonian Botanic Garden before he and his wife moved down to, to Illinois to, for him to become the chair of Southern Illinois University Plant Biology Department. Next to Dale is Dr. Melanie Vile. She has been a collaborator with our group for over, over 20 years. 
She is now at Westchester University in Pennsylvania. And next to Melanie is Kim Scott. Kim Scott has been a research associate working with me in my lab also for over 20 years. So this is kind of our core team and we help try to organize these various herds of cats during the summer uh, as we're conducting research in Alberta. I'd also note uh, that we've been very fortunate to receive funding from a variety of groups. So I wanna acknowledge our funders, the Wood Buffalo Environmental Association, an organization that no longer exists in Alberta, the Cumulative Environmental Management Association. We've had funding from our National Science Foundation and funding from Alberta Environment and Parks in their role as uh, part of the oil sands monitoring program. So all of those people uh, need to be acknowledged. So what are peatlands? So in general, the definition of peatlands can vary from country to country. In Canada, the definition, the broadest definition is their ecosystems that have organic soil, peat is an organic soil, that's at least 40 centimeters thick. And these systems are still actively accumulating peat. And so those three things make something a peatland in, in the Canadian definition. There are two broad classes of peatlands, bogs on the left and fens on the right. The major difference is hydrology. So bogs are, I won't, I won't ask you to remember this word, ombrotrophic. That's a word that comes from the Greek ombros tropikos, meaning nourished by rain. And so in bogs, the sole source of water and nutrients is from rainfall and snowfall. And so, and so that's true for bogs. Bogs are hydrologically isolated from groundwater or surrounding surface water. So they're kind of functioning at, as their own unit on the landscape. In contrast, fens are in contact with groundwater and or surrounding surface water runoff. And so there's inputs of nutrients and water, not only from rain and snow, but also from groundwater and surrounding upwind areas. And so they're very different in terms of their hydrology. There's not very much horizontal water movement in bogs, but fens are sloped and water moves, of course, downhill. So there's surface water movement through the upper layers of fen peat. We don't see that in bogs. I'm mostly gonna be talking about bogs today. So there's a lot of things that are nice about bogs. There's one species of tree. So you don't have to worry about tree identification. It's black spruce. And so there may occasionally be an odd larch in there, but in general, there's one species of tree and that's the black spruce. And then in Alberta bogs, there's this rather continuous cover of small ericaceous shrubs like leatherleaf, Labrador tea and species like that. And if you were to take a look at the surface of the bog, from a grand elevation about my eye level, which is about five feet or so, and look down at the surface of the bog, you see all these little ericaceous shrubs. So this is a Labrador tea. There's a couple of leatherleaf in here. There are lingonberries, there are cranberries, but all of this brownish stuff uh, that you see throughout this, this, uh, this low level aerial photo are sphagnum mosses. And so that is a key feature of bogs in Alberta is a 100% cover of sphagnum mosses. It's sphagnum, in particular the genus sphagnum fuscum, that is critical to the accumulation of these large amounts of peat, which in Alberta can be six or seven meters thick or more. And so how does peat form? So if you look over here on the left, this is of that a square uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeter area. And so the way that peat grows, sphagnum grows, is the upper part of the plant is called the capitulum. So this is a capitulum. And right at the base of the capitulum, cells undergo cell division. One of those cells remains as a, a cell that's going to divide in the future. But the other cell at the bottom starts to elongate. So it starts to grow in length and that pushes the capitulum upwards. And so it's this continuous process of cell division and cell elongation that pushes the top part of the plant upward. And so there's really no upward growth anywhere except at the very underside of this top capitulum layer. And so they do this day after day, year after year, thousands and thousands of years pushing pushing the upward part of the moss plant upward. 
And so you can see that the upper parts of these plants are green, but then you get to an area not very far from the surface where they're brown or dead, right? So and the reason for that, the peat, it's normally this, this would be a lot more densely packed. But if you just think about going down beneath this, these densely packed sphagnum, a couple of centimeters, it's really dark. Sunlight does not penetrate very far into the peat column. And so without light, these cells cannot photosynthesize and they die. And so peat is the accumulation of the dead remains of mostly sphagnum plants that are produced by this upward movement of at the top of the plant, progressively burying the lower parts of the plant that then die and progressively accumulate as peat over time. So that's how peat forms, all from the action of little, these little tiny mosses, these non-vascular plants with no roots and no true leaves. Well, there's a lot of peatlands globally. And so this is a fairly old, old map, but I kind of like it because it's pretty simple to, to understand. So most of the world's peat is in the Northern hemisphere. So of course, all throughout Canada into Alaska, Fennoscandia, the Baltic Republics and the uh, West Siberian lowlands are major places where we find lots of peat on earth. So we don't see a lot of peat in the Southern hemisphere because there's not a lot of land at the appropriate latitudes in the Southern hemisphere. So you can't really see it very well, but this is the 40th parallel, 40th North parallel. So most of the world's peatlands are farther north than 40 degrees. This is the 40th parallel south. There's hardly any land south of the 40th parallel, so there's not a lot of peat in the southern hemisphere. So peatlands are for the most part boreal northern hemisphere ecosystems that are distributed according to this map. Well, there's a lot of peat in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And so this is a map that was produced by Dale Vitt and colleagues in 2000, published, published this, uh, this map that shows the percent cover of peatlands in the so-called prairie provinces of Manitoba, uh, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And you can see in the Hudson Bay lowlands, we can even have 100% cover of the land surface in peat. We work pretty much in this part of Alberta a lot. This is the oil sands region where peatlands can cover 60 to 70% of the land surface. And so if you add up all of this peatland area in these three provinces, peatlands, cover 365 square kilometers of the, the land surface. Just for reference, I've given you the area of Alberta. So Alberta alone is 662,000 square kilometers. So if you put all the peatlands into Alberta, they would occupy about 50% of Alberta's landscape or 55%. So a huge amount of peat in these three provinces. And they have a lot of carbon. Oh, yeah, this is just a to give you a sense of what this actually looks like from the air. So this is a, a photo taken from south of Fort McMurray, south of the Stony Mountains. And all of this is peat, except for like these areas where there's really tall black spruce trees. So this is a bog and this is a bog. So we have black spruce trees that are growing fairly healthily. The bogs are higher in elevation than the fens. So all of this is fen. And in fens, we have horizontal water movement. And so in this case, the fen water is draining in this direction toward this lake. And so if you happen to fall as rain on a bog or a fen, you might eventually find yourself as a water molecule traveling through this fen and into this lake. So this is a, a, what a boggy peatlandy landscape looks like in Northern Alberta. Well, how much carbon is in these, in, is in these systems? And so, Numbers have changed a little bit over the years. So this is a summary, simplified version of, of part of the global carbon cycle, 1991, 2004, 2007. And the amount of carbon in pedograms, so a pedogram is 10 to the 15th grams. So it's kind of hard to envision that. So just look at the numbers. 455 pedograms of carbon in the peatland soils of the world, in peat. And that number hasn't changed very much. It got revised a little bit in 2017 to include some lower estimates, but let's go with 455 pedograms. These three numbers, 670, 455, and 375, is the amount of carbon in all the world's soil. And so the point I wanna make here is that the carbon in peat, 455 
petagrams is about 30% of the carbon in all the world's soil. Yet peatlands only occupy 3% of the land area. So I'm gonna come back to this later. They only occupy 3% of the Earth's land area, but contain 30% of all the world's soil carbon, a testament to how important peatlands have been in terms of storing carbon. And of course, the numbers that have really changed are the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that just keeps going up and up and up. Well, I'm guessing that some of you may have lain awake at night, unable to sleep, wondering this question. What is the average global meter square of peat doing today? Well, I can answer that for you so you'll be able to sleep well. This simple slide came from some early papers published in the 1990s from a distinguished researcher, Evel Gorham who was at the University of Minnesota for the latter part of his career. So he synthesized literature values and the process of net primary production or growth of plants, in particular growth of mosses, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, fixing it by photosynthesis and making moss, on average globally, 370 grams per meter square per year. All that dead peat is decomposing, albeit at a slow rate. And when things decompose, the organic carbon in those things gets converted to CO2, which goes back to the atmosphere. So there's a cycle here. And globally, there's less CO2 being released by decomposition than CO2 that's fixed by photosynthesis. And so the difference, in this case, 23 grams per meter square per year, was Evel Gorham's estimate for the rate at which peatlands are storing carbon on a meter square basis today. So now you know the answer, 23 grams per meter square per year. Or globally, if you multiply this by the global peatland area, 76 teragrams per year. A teragram is 10 to the 12th grams. So globally, peatlands are a large sink for atmospheric CO2. Evel Gorham also talked a little bit about methane. And when we're talking about methane, those fluxes are really, really low. So there are methane fluxes from peatlands, but they're really, really low. So when we're talking about carbon storage and peat, we're really talking about the carbon dioxide aspect of, of the cycle. And so after these papers were published, peat wind ecologists were kind of like, hmm, you know, we hadn't really been thinking about carbon before the 1990s because climate change sort of snuck up on us, I suppose. And so at this point, we kind of thought, you know, we're up here in Alberta, we're in a bog, it's probably accumulating carbon at 23 grams per meter square per year, good enough. Well, that turns out to have been a gross under or gross oversimplification because of this. So you Albertans know this very well. There's fire in the boreal forest and Alberta has uh, lots and lots of, of wildfires uh, across the entire province, but including in the north where we find lots of peatlands. And so I took this picture very carefully from a website, because it wouldn't be wise to be standing there to take pictures like this, uh, from McMaster University website. So there's fire in the boreal forest. And those fires burn not just upland areas, but bogs and fens as well. And so one of Dale Vitt's former students, Merritt Turetsky, published a paper that determined that on average, if you're a bog in Alberta, you're gonna burn every 123 years. And on average, if you're a fen, you're going to burn every 105 years. And so the landscape of, of peatlands in Alberta is not a uniform landscape. It consists of bogs and fens that have burned relatively recently, not so recently, or a long time ago. And so all of these function differently in terms of carbon cycling. And so what does that look like? And so this is, again, Dale Vitt and Brian Benskoder. He's not trying to hide from the camera. I'm just a terrible photographer. So that's why he's been, I caught him with his arm in the air. So this is what a bog looks like after fire. They pretty much all look like this after fire. So all the black spruce trees are dead. So they're still standing, but they're dead. All the ericaceous shrubs that were so abundant on the surface of the peat have the upper, the above ground parts are dead. All the sphagnum mosses in the hollows have been burned and the sphagnum mosses on the hummocks which is mostly sphagnum fuscum, are either dead or decidedly unhappy. So this is not a healthy bunch of sphagnum. Dale Vitt calls these sphagnum sheep, because if you're driving along the road and you see 
a landscape that has dead black spruce trees with these brown humps, sphagnum sheep, you know you are driving past a bog that is recently burned. And so that's, that's sort of one year after fire. This site is not a sink for atmospheric CO2 because there's no photosynthesis going on. And so there's no car carbon being taken out of the atmosphere, but the peat is decomposing, releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. So we know that immediately after fire, just intuitively, bogs are sources of atmospheric CO2, not sinks. So let's look a little farther in time. This is a site that is 20 years after, after fire. This is uh, one of our sites near Red Earth Creek. And so 20 years after fire, there's now a complete cover of sphagnum mosses. There's lots of ericaceous shrubs and the black spruce trees have started to come back in, but they're really, really sparse and really, really tiny. So this is 20 years after fire. In the background is the same bog, but this part of the bog didn't burn when this part of the bog did. So there was a fire line here. So this part back here is older. It's about 50 years after fire. And that's what it looks like. So in the foreground is 20 years after fire and 50 years after fire. And so we've seen a lot of growth of the black spruce trees over this 30 year interval. And then if a bog makes it to 100 years, this is one of our sites that's 100 years after fire, you get some open areas, but there's lots of areas where there's a, a very closed canopy of black spruce and it's really hard to walk in between the trees. And so there's a lots of, lot of succession that happens after fire. And so it kind of looks like at some point these systems are gonna go from a source of CO2 right after fire to a sink of CO2. And we wanted to know how does that happen? Or can we put some numbers on this in terms of the strength of the source and the strength of the sink and how does that change over time? And so one way to do this is go to the burn site and follow it for a hundred years. Okay, that's theoretically possible, but uh, we decided not to do that. So instead, we found 10 bogs that have different times since fire. So this is a chrono sequence. And so these 10 bogs, range from one to 100 years after fire. They're all in Northern Alberta and they're all reasonably accessible by road. And so we measured a lot of different things in these bogs. I just wanna talk about one thing that we measured. We measured CO2 fluxes using something called the closed chamber technique. So I wanna give you some sense as to what, what ecosystem ecologists do and the approach that they use to answer some of these big questions. So we built collars. So this contraption is an aluminum collar. We built 300 of these. And so there are 10 at each of our, 30 at each of our 10 bog sites. And so these collars are pushed down into the peat and they stay there in this case for four years. And you can see there's a, a groove in at the top of this, this collar. And so we put these in, in all the sites. This is one of the older sites. Here's just a picture of one in the site that burned one year ago. And then when we want to go out and measure CO2 fluxes, we put a chamber on top, insert it into these, into these uh, grooves and set the chamber on top of this 60 centimeter by 60 centimeter area of peat. And there's some tubing here and there's a gizmo down here. This is an infrared gas analyzer. And so the tubing recirculates air from the chamber into the analyzer and back into the chamber and instantaneously measure, measures CO2 concentration in the chamber. Okay, so we get, if we leave this chamber on here for a period of time, we can quantify whether CO2 in the chamber is going up or CO2 in the chamber is going down. This is a little probe that also gives us measurements of temperature, photosynthetically active radiation or sunlight and relative humidity inside the chamber. And so again, if, if CO2 goes up during the measurement period, that means that there is more CO2 being produced by decomposition than is photosynthesis. And that this plot is a source of CO2. If CO2 is going down, that means that there's more photosynthesis than decomposition. And this square 60 centimeter plot is the same for atmospheric CO2. So we do this in full light and we wanna know what's the response of, of the source sink relationship to changing light conditions. And so after we do measurements in full light, we cover the chamber in a little bit of shade cloth to partially shade it. And we do this with a variety of different shade cloths until we're measuring fluxes in the dark. And so in the dark, like at night, there's no photosynthesis. And in theory, 
at night, all of these systems are releasing CO2 into the atmosphere uh, by decomposition because there's no photosynthesis. So we do this a lot. Over a four year period, we had about 5,000 measurements of CO2 flux at each site. We've got 10 sites, so 50,000 measurements. Now I'm not gonna go through the math as to what we do with all that data. So what I am gonna do is something my PhD advisor told me a long time ago, is that he could take anyone's dissertation and convert it to the size of a postage stamp. So I'm gonna convert this four year project with 50,000 data points to a postage stamp graphic. Oh, we did this in the winter too, by the way, just, just to show you that we, we're not fair weather ecologists. And so here it is, this is the summary of the entire study. Kind of disappointing actually that you can actually do this, take, take this much work and reduce it to a sing, single figure, but, but we, we can. And so it's time since fire on this axis. So we have chron our chrono sequence sites range from one year after fire to 102 and net carbon accumulation. Moles, you could think grams instead of moles and, and moles per meter, meter square per year. And so immediately after fire, bogs are a major source of carbon to the atmosphere, 170 grams per meter square per year. Again, because there's no photosynthesis. So decomposition is releasing CO2 and there's no photosynthesis. But as the mosses continue to grow and, and begin to cover 100% of the surface, and as those ericaceous shrubs recolonize, now there's photosynthesis. And so everything below this line is a carbon source to the atmosphere and everything above the line is a atmospheric CO2 sink. And so by 12 and a half years after fire, there's been enough regrowth of the mosses and the ericaceous shrubs that now these systems are going to be a sink for atmospheric carbon for the rest of their life until they burn again. And so that's shown by this line above the, the, gray, uh, the gray filling. We also showed that black spruce, as you know, takes a while to come in. So 20 years after fire, there still wasn't much black spruce. We get carbon accumulation, both in the fine roots and the coarse roots of black spruce. And in the above ground tree component, this component peaks at about 75 years. This is true for all forests, by the way. So maximum carbon accumulation in upland forest as well as bogs does not occur in the oldest forest, but occurs in middle-aged forests. So this is uh, consistent with what we see in, in upland forests as well. If this bog has continued to undergo development until 125 years, where it's gonna burn again, at the end of this period, it's, it's accumulating carbon at 114 grams per meter square per year. This is far higher than the estimate of Evogorum of 23. And so again, bogs on the landscape are individual patches that have burned at a different time since fire. And so if we average all of this out across all ages of time since fire, the average Alberta bog carbon sink is 77 grams per meter square per year, much higher than the number of 23 that Evel Gorham proposed in the 1990s. Okay, so I'm gonna summarize this part of the talk. There's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, 860 petagrams as CO2. That number keeps going up. So just to, to show you, this is the CO2 concentration at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, the longest continuous atmospheric CO2 measurement on the planet. A year later, it had gone up by four parts per million. And so this is typical of what's been happening uh, in the industrial age that CO2 in the atmosphere keeps going up and up and up. That's how much carbon is in peat globally, okay? And so what I want you to do is compare these numbers to this number. And so remember all the peat globally used to be CO2 in the atmosphere that plants, mostly mosses, took out of the atmosphere and made into moss. And then it buried that as dead moss in peat that has vertically accumulated over several meters over the past 6,000 years. And so if you think about it, if you took all of this carbon in peat and put it back in the atmosphere from whence it came, that would increase atmospheric CO2 pools to 1300 and we would be toasting. This would be a really, really hot world. So I think that this simple comparison is illustrative of the extremely important role that peatlands have played globally in terms of sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and storing it as peat. 
So again, it's 3% of the Earth's land area, 30% of the Earth's soil carbon. I'd like to use an analogy that I think people might relate to a little bit more. And I, I often use money analogies. For, for some reason, people relate to money better than they do carbon sometimes. So let's use this analogy. Let's say we had a class of 100 students. And those 100 students represent global soil carbon. And that there's 100, 000, there's 100, there's 1,000 units. So $1,000 distributed among the class of 100 students. And there are PEAT students and non-PEAT students. So 3%, 3% of 100 is three students would each have $100. So 3% of the population of, of the population of the class has $300, that's 30% of the total. The other poor 97 students, the non-PEAT students have $7.22 each. And so that's a, a dollar illustration of how important peatlands are in terms of sequestering carbon. Now, a couple more things. This is an even sim more simplified version of what I've talked about so far. So today, peat accumulates because photosynthesis, the conversion of atmospheric CO2, mostly to moss, heterotroph respiration is another way of saying decomposition. So that's today. And so peat is accumulating carbon in Alberta. As part of the same study, we asked the question, what if summer temperatures in Alberta increased by two degrees centigrade, which is likely to happen in the next several decades? And by, you see by this graphic, this arrow has now gotten fatter. And that's because decomposition and plant respiration are very te temperature sensitive. Photosynthesis is not very temperature sensitive. And so as the earth gets warmer, not by very much in Northern Alberta, Photosynthesis is not very much changed, but decomposition and plant respiration increases to the point where these two arrows are equal and the system is no longer a source or a sink for atmospheric CO2. And so this vast carbon sink of Alberta peatlands may disappear uh, in the next couple of decades because of warmer temperatures. Another factor that will contribute to this is decreasing fire return interval. And so even if temperatures didn't warm, if peatlands burn more frequently, which they will do under climate change, that means we have more peatlands on the left-hand side of that, that curve that I showed you that are accumulating less carbon. And so either one of these things, an increase in midsummer temperatures by two degrees or a decrease in the fire return interval to 61 years will result in the loss of the peatland sink in Alberta. This was all published in a paper in 2009. Okay. This is a pretty picture to allow you to rest a minute, collect your thoughts uh, before I segue into the next part of the presentation. And, and Philip, how am I doing on time? You're, you're doing a good tell. You're at just over like 32 minutes. Okay. So I'm gonna segue into oil sands. So of course, you're Albertans, you know, what, you know what the oil sands are. And so this is a commonly shown map of the oil sands of, of Alberta, three different general regions. We have worked mostly in the Athabasca oil sands region of Northern Alberta. You hear different numbers, but Alberta has probably the third largest uh, harvestable oil reserves on the planet. Okay, so there's a huge amount of oil in the oil sands of Alberta. I wanna show you in case you haven't seen this, how oil sands develop has, development has changed over the years. And so of course, the first bridge over the Athabasca River, which allowed access to the oil sands region, was only completed in 1965. And so there couldn't really be development of the oil sands resources until there were roads. And so there were no roads until this bridge was completed in 1965. There was a small experimental uh, bitumen facility in the at Bitumount, Alberta. Uh, you may have heard of that. But all the supplies and equipment that got to bitch them out originally had to be gotten there by river traffic up the Athabasca River. And so that early operation pilot plant at bitch them out, uh, going back to the 1920s, I think, was, was before there were roads. So let's look at this in 10 year intervals. So this is 1984, 1994, a little bit more development. This is mostly Syncrude and Suncor, but then it really took off. So there's the footprint in 2004, in 2014, 
and in 2020. And this continues today. And so a large amount of area has been, uh, the natural systems have been replaced by areas devoid of vegetation throughout the oil sands region. So, so what? What's it have to do with, with carbon? So Li and Chang published a paper that, that said, under full development of the oil sands, so if all the mineable oil sands are mined, then in this oil sands region, this many hectares of peatland would be affected. And so we took that number and multiplied it by our sink number of 77 grams per meter square per year. And so the effect of, of, of uh, eliminating essentially these peatlands on the landscape would decrease the regional carbon sink in the Athabasca oil sands region by about 0.4 teragrams per year, 0.4 times 10 to the 12 teragrams per year. And so there's a direct effect of oil sands development on the strength of the carbon sink in peatlands, lowering that sink by about one eighth. Now the oil sand industry currently releases a lot of CO2, both from the upgrader stacks, the power plant stacks, and the, the trucks, the fleets that are operating all the time. And so 19 teragrams of CO2 per year are released by oil sands operation. Interestingly, if we calculate the carbon sink for the peatlands across all of the Prairie provinces, regionally, it's about the same magnitude as the CO2 that's, that's being released by the oil sands industry. And so today, the region's peatlands are in some ways mitigating or offsetting the CO2 emissions from oil sands. But as we just talked about, these carbon sink numbers are going to diminish into the future. And so this could actually decrease to zero. Okay, just a couple of interesting facts that you may or may not know about, about uh, Alberta's oil and oil sands. Most of, Can most of Canada's oil production is, I think that means, I think that should have said Alberta actually. So I'd have to check that. It's either 74% of Canada's oil production or 70% of Alberta's oil production is exported to the, to the US. It's a higher percentage of the oil sands produced oil exported to the United States. And so this has implications for the United States imports. So this is a graph of US uh, uh, oil imports from 1970, sort of the beginning of oil sands development up to more or less present. And early on, before there was a lot of oil sands production, the United States relied heavily on Saudi Arabia in particular and the Persian Gulf in general for importing oil. That changed in 2004. So in 2004, as oil sands uh, development was increasing, there was a switch. So now the United States imported more oil from, from Canada and mostly from Alberta than from Saudi Arabia. And in 2009, we imported more oil from Canada than from all of the Persian Gulf. And that has taken off since 2009. And so today, 62% of the oil imports uh, in the United States are from Canada. A big chunk of that is from oil sands. And so from my perspective, we really can't sit back and just ignore oil sands and say that's a Canadian problem because we are a part of the environmental ramifications of, of the oil sands development. Okay, so there's a couple other things about oil sands development that are, shall we say, not so good. And so prior to oil sands development, that part of Northern Alberta had some of the cleanest air and cleanest water in North America, very little pollution of any sort. So now we have these heavy hauler trucks, these huge uh, gigantic heavy hauler trucks operating 365 days a year, burning diesel fuel. That burning of diesel fuel re releases nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere, sorry. And so these trucks are operating 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, stopping only to refuel or for maintenance and repair. They're not great on gas mileage. So here's the average uh, diesel mileage for one of these trucks. Uh, I've given it to you both in metric and non-metric units. So a gallon of diesel will get you 0.3 miles or eight liters of diesel will get you one kilometer. And so, they're burning lots and lots of diesel fuel across the oil sands region, releasing lots of lots of nitrogen oxides. Then there's this. So mainly the upgrader stacks are releasing huge amounts of sulfur oxides to the atmosphere as well. Okay, so there aren't that many upgrader stacks, but they are producing 
and releasing lots of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. And so you now realize that these are the precursors, these nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides are the precursors to acid rain. What goes up must come down, and in fact, it does. So how much goes up? This is a kind of an interesting graph. So these are emissions of SO2 and nitrogen oxides from 1998 through 2019. So this is often the National Pollutant Release Inventory. And so there aren't any data prior to 1998. And so SO2 emissions were sort of gently going up until 2009, when the industry started installing scrubbers on the stacks to take the CO2 out of the gases that left those stacks. And it was tremendously effective. And so CO2 emissions kind of dropped through 2014 and, and remained steady at about 45 thousand metric tons per year. So they've dropped, but that's a big number, thousand metric tons. Nitrogen oxide uh, emissions have gone up and up and up. And again, this is mostly from the fleets of those big diesel heavy haulers and other mine equipment. And so that continues to go up. It's directly related to the amount of crude uh, oil sands uh, bitumen that is produced every year. So as that goes up and up and up, there's more and more nitrogen oxide released to the atmosphere. And remember, back before oil sands, these values were zero. So we've gone from zero to uh, about 95,000 metric tons of nitrogen oxide being released into the environment. And again, what goes up must come down. And so are we seeing increased nitrogen and sulfur deposition in rain and snow? And so our group measures this as does the uh, WABIA, Wood Buffalo Environmental Association using these things called ion exchange resin collectors. So you can place these out in remote situations. They collect rain and snow. It drains down into these tubes, which catches ions and retains those ions. So ammonium nitrate and sulfate stick onto resins inside these tubes. We can bring them back to the lab and, and measure how much is there. And so these are maps of this is dissolved inorganic nitrogen. So this is ammonium plus nitrate, and this is sulfate deposition. This is sort of the oil sands footprint. So this is the mostly tin crude and sun core operations. And so, and this is highway 63 moving north through these operations. So red is high deposition and blue is low deposition. And so there are other maps that have been uh, constructed that show the same thing. There is considerably enhanced deposition of nitrogen and sulfur in rain and snow, especially as you get closer and closer to the heart of the oil sands area. Deposition decreases more or less exponentially with distance, but there's large reason, regions of uh, the oil sands region where the surrounding bogs and upland systems and, and water bodies are receiving much higher deposition of nitrogen and sulfur than they have prior to oil sands development. And so we wanted to know, does, does this matter? And so we wrote a proposal to the organization formerly known as SEMA, Cumulative Environmental Management Association. We proposed that we could do an experiment in the field to experimentally apply nitrogen to a bog and a poor fen and, and assess the responses to increasing nitrogen deposition. So we'll do a grand field experiment. We chose to do this at what's called the Mariana Lake Peak Complex. So, so this is Highway 63 up in the upper corner. Maybe it doesn't, didn't show up in here, but Highway 63 is just up here. So we can access this site on a gravel road. So this is the peatland complex. The brownish part is poor fen. And so remember, poor fens have horizontal water movement. And so this region is gently sloping in this direction. So water moves through the poor fen and it ultimately goes underneath the, the road here in a culvert. So that's the poor fen. This area is bog and this area is bog. And these areas that look like they burned are areas that burned. So this, these are areas that burned in the, the Horse River fire, which I think was 2002. And so the fire didn't make it all the way into this bog. And so we conducted this experiment in this part of the poor fen and in this part of the bog. And I wanna show you how we did this because I think it's kind of interesting to, to see the effort that went into conducting this great experiment. So let's go through this. So essentially, we wanted to experiment, experimentally add nitrogen in increasing amounts. So we had seven treatments, add nothing, 
at water only. So we're gonna, we're gonna have synthetic rain that we're gonna rain on these, these sites. And nitrogen deposition, simulated nitrogen deposition at these five different levels. So seven different treatments. Three plots per treatment. Each plot was 7.2 meters square. So we had 21 plots in the bog and 21 plots in the fen. So how do we actually do this? Well, first we gotta build a boardwalk. We build a lot of boardwalks and bogs and fens in Alberta, because if you don't build a boardwalk, you're gonna ruin the site by people trampling through the, through the site. So it's very important that we build boardwalks. So the first thing we do is order a bunch of lumber. So spruce land lumber delivered our, our lumber to the site and gently offloaded it. As you can see here, it's quite the, uh, <laughs> it's quite the thing to watch. Uh, so we, we got our lumber and then we commenced to build the boardwalk. And so this is well, actually two boards at a time into the poor fen and into the bog. So, so this is looking at the edge of the poor fen and the bog is in the background over here. So this boardwalk was a kilometer long. It took us about three days to build it. Lots of manual labor, lots of people. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of our crew for doing this with, uh, with a very good positive spirit. So we got this built in about three or four days. And this is one of the arms with the treatment plots. And so we had three arms with a treatment plot. So this is one 7.2 meter square plot. This is another one, there's another one. So we staggered them on left and right sides of, of each arm and that was the experimental setup. Okay, and so this is the boardwalk going across the fen toward the bog and that's the boardwalk going into the bog. So lots of boardwalk. We built a shed uh, to, to house all of our equipment in, which was an experience for many of our undergraduate students, some of which had never held a hammer before. So that was interesting. Of course, we had security. Beware of dog, there, there was no dog, of course. And you might notice this, I don't know. When, when you have students and they ask you innocently, can we paint the inside of the shed? And you say, yeah, why not? This is what you get. So, you know, you never know what's, what's gonna happen sometimes with students. Okay, so how do we actually do the experiment? And so we have to get water, we have to get lots of water. And so we ordered our water from, from Nippy, which is a, a potable water company in Fort Mac. It's a First Nations owned community. I, I believe Nippy is the word for water in Cree. So, so we thought it was appropriate to, to use a First Nations community to get the water delivered to site. This is Floyd. And so this is Floyd filling up a 13,000 liter collapsible firefighting water tank. And so the first thing we have to do is get the water from the truck to the tank. Then we're gonna pump this water through the upwind part uh, between the road and the poor fan using fairly large firefighting water pumps through the woods to another 13,000 liter tank close to the edge of the fan. Then we're gonna pump that water using another set of pumps into a platform that's in the bog and a platform that's in the fan. So on this platform, we have these 150 gallon uh, plastic tanks that we're gonna fill up with water. And this is where we're gonna add ammonium and nitrate, which will dissolve in, in the water to give us our different levels of nitrogen. So zero, five, 10, 15, 20, 25 kilograms per hectare per year of nitrogen. So now we've got our water treatments all set up. Then we're gonna pump that water with smaller pumps and smaller hoses to each one of the 21 plots and give the appropriate dosage of nitrogen to each one of the plots. So here's fertilizing in the, in the poor fen, and this is what it looked like in the bog. And so we did this seven times during the growth growing season for each of four years. It took about one full day to get all of this done. And then of course, in the end, we got to haul all of this stuff back and store it in the shed. And so a huge amount of work. And I'm, I'm really proud of our team for getting this done so seamlessly for a four year stretch of time. So that's how we do it. If you want to see videos, there's videos on my website. So it's kind of, I think it's kind of fun to watch this in action. So if you're so, the spirit moves, then go ahead and check out some of the videos. Okay, I'm not gonna show you data. I'll just tell you what we learned. And I'm not gonna tell you everything we learned because it's too much. So we learned that setting this up and executing the, the treatments was challenging. And this was a huge amount of hard work, which is why we hire young students. Uh, so, so that was, you know, again, I'm very proud of them for pulling this off. A couple of key findings though. Even at the highest nitrogen addition rate, 25 kilograms per hectare per year, 
we never saw an increase in ammonium or nitrate concentrations in the pore water of the bog or the pore fen, even if we came back the next day. So this is a huge amount of nitrogen that we are adding. And we expected to find it, some of, some of it making into the pore water and seeing elevated concentrations of ammonium or nitrate. We never found that. And so this tells us that bogs and pore fens are extremely effective scavengers of nitrogen deposition, even when that deposition is at really high rates. Or another way of looking at this is on the landscape, since bogs are the highest point on the landscape, fens are a little bit lower and lakes and streams are even lower. If this high nitrogen deposition lands on a bog or a poor fen, it's likely to protect downstream water bodies from, from receiving elevated nitrate and ammonium concentrations. A lot of people think that sphagnum fuscum is nitrogen limited and it's not. And so we did not see that nitrogen fus uh, sphagnum fuscum was stimulated by N addition. And in fact, high levels of nitrogen addition actually uh, inhibited sphagnum growth in the bog. And so this is important because if sphagnum fuscum, the dominant peat forming moss is growing less, that means the carbon sink is less strong. Right? So a major part of the carbon sink is mosses taking CO2 and making moss. And if that process gets lower because of high nitrogen deposition, we are lowering the peatland carbon sink. Further complicating matters is we saw an increase in shrub and black spruce growth and an increase in, black, in shrub cover. This is those small ericaceous shrubs in response to increasing nitrogen deposition. A consequence of the, there are two consequences. One, there's greater competition between the shrubs and the mosses for nitrogen. And two, shrubs shade. Say that three times quickly, shrubs shade. And so when we have increased shrub cover, there's more shade and mosses don't grow as well. If sphagnum fuscum does not grow as well, we've diminished the carbon sink. And so there are implications for the carbon sink strength of bogs and poor fins in the oil sands region because of enhanced nitrogen deposition. And so we've published papers on, on all of this. You can actually see this. So you can see this in the field, but this is a drone picture. So again, this is our poor fin. So this is each arm. So this is a control 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 kilograms per hectare per year. And I think you can see that, especially in the 20 and 25, they look a little greener and more dense uh, than these plots with lower nitrogen deposition. And in fact, they are. And that, that visual effect is indicating that we have stimulated shrub growth and shrub cover. And there's a little close up. Okay, I've got a couple more slides. I'm doing okay, Philip? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so that was the Mariana Lakes uh, study. The question is how transferable are these? results to the oil sands region. So there's some fundamental differences between what we did and what's happening in the oil sands region. We had some really high doses of nitrogen, up to 25 kilograms per hectare per year. Maximum nitrogen deposition in the oil sands region is closer to nine or 10. We applied this over four years to, to systems that had never seen high nitrogen deposition. So it wasn't really a chronic thing. It was acute. We all of a sudden came in and started dumping nitrogen on. So we don't really have long-term effects. It's probably the case that in the oil sands region, nitrogen deposition has been steadily increasing since the late 1970s. So it's been, there's been chronic increasing nitrogen deposition. And we don't know whether the effects from an acute study, like we did in the field, and chronic deposition are going to produce the same effects. And so how do we get at that question? Well, through monitoring. And so we had been monitoring bogs in the oil sands region since 2009, originally with support from the Wood Buffalo Environmental Association. And so these are our sites in 2009. Uh, this site at Uticama and this site at Mildred were actually destroyed by wildfire. So that's a risk you take when you're working in bogs in Alberta. Your site's probably gonna burn sometime, two of ours did. And so we continued this through 2019 when we were funded by the Oil Sands Monitoring Program who asked us to add, to add two more sites. So we added this site up by Curl Lake and this site 
a little bit farther away at Horse Creek Bog. And so we've been monitoring these since 19, uh, 2019. So have we seen the effects from the Mariana Lake experiment occurring through this monitoring effort? Sometimes yes, so we published a lot of papers on this. I'm not gonna go through these at, at, at all, but uh, there, there is evidence that this long-term chronic nitrogen on bogs in the oceans region, most of which are not positive. I will show you one piece of data, however. So I'll spend some time talking about this because it's the data slide. So these are, these are monitoring. So this is looking at nitrogen concentration in cranberry leaves. And so as part of our monitoring effort, we collect replicate samples of cranberry, separate the leaves from the stem in the lab and analyze those leaves for nitrogen. This is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of samples. And so these are the five sites that we began start, started monitoring in 2009. And there are two things here that are uh, relevant to the issue of is oil sands nitrogen deposition affecting cranberry? These sites are arrayed from left to right, closest to the oil sands and farthest away. In general, the sites closest, Mildred and JPH4, have higher nitrogen concentrations than the sites farther away. I won't show you the statistics, but that's statistically true. And so if you're cranberry living near the oil sands, you have higher nitrogen in your leaves than if you're farther away. That's consistent with an effect of oil sands nitrogen deposition. But you can also see that at least between 2009 and 2013, nitrogen concentrations were increasing. And so this is something that may be an indicator of future damage to cranberries. And so if you're a cranberry or a, a bog plant, bogs are a nutrient deficient environment, particularly nitrogen deficient. And so bog plants often have the ability, if all of a sudden nitrogen becomes available, a bear comes by and pees next to you, for example. Now you've got a, a nice supply of nitrogen that you normally don't have. You can take that up in excess and store it in your leaves. And so you would have an increase in nitrogen concentration. But typically that's a short life phenomenon. And so as the plant continues to grow, it uses that nitrogen and nitrogen concentrations go back to normal. And so it's common for bog plants to show pulses in nitrogen concentration that are relatively short lived. This phenomenon of a progressive increase in nitrogen concentration. And remember over this period of time, nitrogen emissions from oil sands had been steadily increasing is consistent with a chronically increased and elevated nitrogen concentration in cranberry leaves. Now, plant physiologists tell us, and you know this from gardening, if you have a vegetable garden, you can over fertilize your vegetable garden. And that sort of same thing can happen in, in bog plants. And so it looks like cranberries have accumulated all the nitrogen they're capable of accumulating. It actually went down a little bit in these three years. And so, at this point, it may be that there are physiologically negative consequences to these high nitrogen concentration. And so what happens to cranberry in terms of its abundance and nitrogen concentration in the future would require monitoring. So are we continuing to monitor? Uh, our last year of being in Alberta was 2019 because COVID happened. And so we, even if we wanted to, we pretty much could not get into Canada. Uh, and we haven't been back since then. And so at the moment, all monitoring of bogs in the oil sands region is not happening. And whether it's gonna happen in the future, I, I, I don't know. And so I'll take questions, but just to summarize, peatlands are important. They're really important as a sink for atmospheric CO2. This is true globally and locally. They're under threat, under stress from climate change because temperatures are going to increase and fire return interval is going to decrease. And so it could be that in the next 20 years, the large carbon sink of bogs and, and poor fens in Northern Alberta could disappear. You wouldn't even know it. They could look exactly the same on the surface, but literally they would be shrinking instead of growing. Oil sands emissions, in particular nitrogen, have effects on sphagnum mosses, decreasing their production, and allowing shrubs to shade them, which also diminishes the carbon sink 
uh, of peatlands. And so this major, major function of, of peatlands, the carbon sink function is being threatened both by climate change uh, globally and by oil sands development regionally. So I hope you found that uh, informative and somewhat interesting and uh, I'll defer to Philip as to how we're gonna handle questions, but I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, thanks so much, Kel. Uh, um, for, for questions, we've got a few already coming through the chat. So if people want to put them into the chat, that's great. I can read them out. Or um, if you'd like to use the reaction button on Zoom to raise your hand, um, then I can just call people forward to, to come off of mute and, um, and say their questions that way. But um, I'll start with the ones that we have in the chat right now. Um, Kel, do you have any measurements for carbon accumulation rates um, accounting for wildfire disturbance um, in FENS, similar to the data you have for box? We don't. Uh, we just haven't done that. Uh, it would be nice to do that. There, there are, there's less data in general for FENS than there are for BOGS. So there's some data in the literature. Um, there's a little bit of data for Alberta for different kinds of fens, um, but I, I, I believe that poor fens anyway, so poor fens are acidic and sphagnum dominated, would have numbers that are pretty similar to, to what we see in bogs. Great, um, the next question in the chat was, uh, what about sulfur deposition on the fens and bogs? I, I think this is in relation to you just talking about nitrogen specifically. Sorry, I was reading the chat myself. I didn't get that. Yeah. Oh, just, uh, yeah. What about sulfur deposition on the fence and oh. box? Okay, so I didn't talk about that. Sulfur is a, a different beast pretty much entirely. So it is a nutrient and it's required by vegetation. It looks as though there's plenty of sulfur already there. So, so it's not limiting, um, but there are a couple of things that sulfur could do. This might be a little bit of a rambling answer, but I'll, I'll do my best. So sulfate participates in something called sulfate reduction. So there are bacteria that live in peat that live without oxygen. So, you know, like aerobic respiration, like we have, we take sugars and oxygen and make CO2 and water and energy. That's respiration in cells. There are bacteria that don't use oxygen, but use sulfur, sulfate, and reduce that sulfate to sulfide. And so we could actually stimulate the production of CO2 because sulfate reducers produce CO2 by having more sulfate coming in. And so there's some evidence uh, from work that Melanie Weil did uh, that that would happen. Another consequence, which is potentially important I said methane emissions are low, but they're not zero. When you add sulfate to a bog, you inhibit methane production. And there's reasons for that and uh, that they're pretty well understood. And so one consequence of increasing sulfate deposition could be to inhibit or lessen the amount of methane that's emitted from, from bogs to the atmosphere. Uh, we, we proposed to study that a while ago and, you know, ran it up the flagpole and nobody saluted. So, uh, but, but yeah, sulf sulfate could have some implications. Thanks for that, Kel. Uh, next question in the chat. Do you know how well peatlands in Saskatchewan have been studied? Uh, I assume there are more areas with bog cover than what was indicated in the earlier map, um, knowing there's less research done here. <clears throat> That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm not sure the map is, I think the map's pretty accurate. So before we were interested in, in fire, we actually did some research in Northern Saskatchewan with regard to permafrost melt. So we had sites just south of the First Nations community of Patchenac, where there was still some intact permafrost, but some places where permafrost had recently melted. And so we were looking at carbon cycling in those sites. And, and we published, I think, a couple of papers on that. 
but actually there, there's not been a lot of work done in Saskatchewan. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, next question was with the threats described, oil sands and climate change, uh, what would you recommend as best approaches for protecting bogs and fence? Might be a, a, big, a big ask. Well, <clears throat> one must be a pragmatist in this world. Um, so I'm not going to say, let's not have any oil sands development. That's uh, that's not going to happen. There's going to be oil sand development. Uh, and so we have to accept that as, as even if we don't like it. I mean, it's, that's the reality. There are efforts at uh, restoring peatlands as a part of the reclamation process. And so there are really two projects in the oil sands region. One is uh, on Syncrude property done by mostly Dale Vitz group. And the other is on Suncor property and I think Jan Siporowski at Calgary is involved in that one. There are different kinds of peatlands. Um, but if we could, during reclamation, restore peatlands, that would be a good thing. Uh, it's tricky. I mean, there, there's lots of problems with it. Uh, one of the major problems is salinity. So. A lot of the material uh, left behind after mining is, is saline or the water that would be there is saline. And so there are saline, natural saline fens in Alberta. So I think restoration would be an, an excellent thing to do. Great. Um, another question here. Um, could you comment on the legacy of fire suppression? and how many swamps that are mapped across the boreal may actually be mature bogs? I ask this question because new wetland inventories show large areas of swamps, which are in fact peatlands, but often not acknowledged as such. <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think there are some terminology issues. Um, you can't tell a swamp from a rich fen by air photos or Google Earth. Uh, so a swamp would be a treed wetland that does not have a lot of peat and is not accumulating peat. A rich fen, and, and swamps really wouldn't have a lot of mosses. Rich fens are often treed with conifers. Uh, rich fens are, are higher pH. They often have a lot of mosses and they can form a lot of peat. And so there's no solution to this. You know, the new merged Alberta wetland inventory, I think some of the things that are swamps, my, my collaborator Dale Vitt is better at this than I am. He would probably call those rich fence. And so I don't think there's been a, a direct comparison of those two inventories, the earlier wetland inventory that Dale Vitt's group did in the new Alberta Merged Wetland Inventory. So I, I think there are some terminology issues. Um, I saw also that uh, Melanie is, uh, you just turned your camera on and I know she's a collaborator of yours. Did you wanna say anything as well, Melanie? Or were you just, uh, I wasn't sure if it was related. Oh, oh I think she's on mute. Uh, I was actually just unmuting just to provide support for Cal. <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, another question here was, if, if there are birch trees, would that not be considered a bog, even if all other aspects indicate that it's a bog, or would birch trees just ring a bog itself? If there's birch trees, it's not a bog. Okay. There might be people that disagree with that, you know, so I, I don't want to be a, you know, th th there are terminology issues. And if you get five bog people or peatland people in a room, they might not all agree. So in Dale Vitt's world, even if you have bog birch, right? So bog birch is an indicator of fens. 
So it, it's, it can be a little confusing. Except that, I mean, you know, when we talk about bogs and fens, it's not completely a black box, right? Like it's a gradient. And so like, yes, there might be the one larch or bog birch, but that doesn't mean that it's not a bog. So it's, it's tricky. And, you know, luckily because we had Dale in the ground, we were able to like discern the difference between those, like, you know, like there's one larch or there's one bog birch. And I just, yeah, I, I unmuted myself just to say, and this is the only reason why I unmuted myself, sorry, Gil, but that, you know, to restore peatlands, it, these systems have accumulated over the last eight to 10,000 years on the landscape. They are mosses that accumulate vertically. So when we, excavate them for oil sands, and then we reclimate the area, you're not putting back a bog. At best, you're putting back something, a landscape of sorts. And maybe it'll be a wetland, maybe it'll be a fen, but it's not ever going to be a bog. And so that's why I initially unmuted my mic. So sorry, Cal, didn't mean to rain on your parade, but just, you know. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nelly. Uh, I think it looks like we have one more question here, and I think we'll we'll probably end it with this one. Um, so, thinking about nature-based solutions to climate change and how we might implement these to ensure long-term sequestration of carbon in peatlands, um, it's more of a question: If you are aware of work being done by the Dene Tha First Nation um, to establish an IPCA for nature-based solutions. And if you have any sort of like comments or anything to add on that. I, I am not aware and I, I wish I were. This, this sounds like something I'd be just so interested in, so. Um, I'll just say then as a follow-up to that, Lori, who put that in the chat, um, if, uh, if she would like to send to me, I can send any information along to Kel. Um, people should be able to contact me through the emails sent out recently, so. Um, if there's no other questions, I think we'll end the, the questions there. Oh, Kelly, do you Can want just, to say something? Yeah. Uh, if you have further questions, feel free to email me. Uh, Philip has my email address. So I'm, I'm findable on the web. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions anybody has. So, or if I don't know the answer, I can refer you to someone that can answer better than I can. So always happy to do whatever I can. Great. Yeah. Thanks again so much, Kel, for, for this presentation and taking time out of your, your evening to talk to us. Um, I know that for myself, at least, uh, I'm still very new to my work at AWA and in both, you know, understanding wetlands and the oil sands monitoring program. So I feel like I finally have a bit of a, you know, a starting point with my wetlands knowledge. Um, and I, yeah, I really appreciate that. So yeah, thanks again. All right, talk to you later. Bye.